Well, the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Because the there are a number of factors that drive the price of gold, and you know them. Uh, but just for the benefit of the, the viewers, you know, you start with supply and demand. Supply has been constant. Global mining output has not gone has, hasn't gone up or down very much for about six years. It's pretty flat. Demand is going up, not because of retail. Americans don't understand it, but uh, central banks do. And you know, Russia, you know, Russia, China, Mexico, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, long list of central banks have been acquiring gold. They're, by the way, they're acquiring more gold now because this whole treasury bill confiscation we talked about earlier. So when demand is up and supply is flat, that tends to drive prices higher. So that's a good start. In this next conversation, financial expert Jim Rickards explains the factors driving the rise in gold prices in 2024. He points to a constant supply and increasing demand from central banks like Russia, China and others, emphasizing their growing interest in gold amid concerns about treasury bills. However, the primary catalyst for the surge in gold prices is the anticipated steep decline in interest rates. Rickards forecasts a significant drop in interest rates, especially in the 10-year note from 4% to the two-handle, driving gold prices higher. Well, the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Because the there are a number of factors that drive the price of gold, and you know them. Uh, but just for the benefit of the, the viewers, you know, you start with supply and demand. Supply has been constant. Global mining output has not gone has hasn't gone up or down very much for about six years. It's pretty flat. Demand is going up, not because of retail. Americans don't understand it, but uh, central banks do. And you know, Russia, you know, Russia, China, Mexico, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, long list of central banks have been acquiring gold. They're, by the way, they're acquiring more gold now because this whole treasury bill confiscation we talked about earlier. So when demand is up and supply is flat, that tends to drive prices higher. So that's a good start. Um, but the but the biggest factor driving gold prices recently is declining interest rates. So if you said, Jim, give me your forecast for gold, I would say, well, let's start with the forecast for interest rates. And the forecast for interest rates is they're going to drop a lot, very steeply. They already have. The, the yield of maturity on the 10-year note dropped from 5% to 4% in like the blink of an eye. It was like a couple of weeks uh, in November and December. Now it's backed up a little bit, you know, like, yeah, nothing goes in a straight line. We know that. So the, the past couple of days, well, a week or so, uh, the yield is kind of backed up from 3.85 to, you know, four, but that's temporary. It's going to go to two or lower because now, now we're back to the recession. You get the kind of recession and disinflation and even deflation that I see that we're talking about, then interest rates are going to come down a lot. Uh, so I would look for the yield of maturity on the 10 year note to drop from four to three to the two handle. And that's going to send the price of gold a lot higher. In this intriguing discussion, financial expert Jim Rickards draws parallels between historical financial crises, emphasizing the two-stage nature of their unfolding. He highlights the events leading to crises in 1998 and 2007 to 2008, noting quiet periods in between before escalating turmoil. Rickards suggests we are currently in a quarter stage, predicting a return of a banking crisis. He then compares Bitcoin to a casino chip, asserting its value only within the crypto realm and questioning its use case beyond speculation and entertainment. Rickards concludes by advocating for gold as a tangible asset amid potential economic uncertainties in 2024. With that, let's dive into the video to hear Jim's full thesis. Well, first of all, that's what history shows. And uh, you know, none of these things are completely deterministic, but financial history is a can be a pretty good guide. And you go back to um, uh, 1998, well, 1997, 1998, what happened, just very briefly, that crisis started, you know, it came to a head in September 1998 with long-term capital management and the Russian default. But it started in Thailand in June 1997 when they closed the capital account and devalued the, the Thai bot. And that started a panic throughout Asia because everyone assumed that all these pegs to the dollar were safe and you could put dollars into Thailand and Indonesia and so forth and not have to worry about the exchange rate. And all of a sudden there was a run on the bank. Everyone, I talked to 
Dr. Mahathir, who's the prime minister of Malaysia, about this. He was the only guy who kind of got it right. But once Thai did that, then there was there was a sequential collapse, bank run, if you will, in Indonesia, um, uh, South Korea, uh, Malaysia, you know, et cetera, throughout Southeast Asia. But then it calmed down in the winter by December. Uh, but it was very serious in the fall. I mean, people were getting killed in the in the streets in South Korea. But by December 97, January 98, February 98, it had died down. It looked like it was over. And I was at long-term capital management. We didn't, we weren't worried about it. We were looking at expanding our business in Asia. And, you know, we we actually paid a, a $3 billion all-cash dividend uh, in December 97. And that's how confident we were. We gave $3 billion back to our investors. Um, but then by April, it started to hot up again. And then uh, the the Russian default was in August and the LTCM meltdown was in September. So that had a, two stages, but a quiet period in between. Same thing in 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis. That really took off yep. in the spring of 07 uh, with the mortgage losses. And then, you know, we all remember Jim Cramer's, you know, they know nothing. Then it died down in the winter. Uh, and then, but it came back with Bear Stearns. So these things do have two stages. We're in a quiet stage right now, but I expect the banking crisis will return. Well, look, when you say it's here to stay, gambling is here to stay. You know, they gambled during the French Revolution and they gambled in 19th century London and you can go to Las Vegas, Atlantic City today. So gambling is here to stay. It's a, um, it's not a particularly productive activity. It costs people more than they make. Uh, but it's a form of entertainment. So I think of Bitcoin as a form of entertainment. Uh, it, well, but well, put it this way. You go into a casino. I think of Bitcoin as a casino chip. Okay, so you go into a casino. You put $1,000 down the roulette table. Coupier gives you $1,000 worth of chips. You gamble. You could make money or lose money. When you're done, you pick up your chips. You go to the cashier and you get dollars and you go outside. So in other words, in the world of crypto, you can buy and sell Bitcoin all day long and you can calculate dollar profits. But if you want your profits, you have to sell it, get your dollars out of that world and go back out on the street. But the Bitcoin itself has no value outside the casino. Like if I if I walk out of the casino with the chips in my pocket and try to buy a cup of coffee with the chips, you can't do it. I mean, maybe somebody will help you out, but, but basically you got to convert back to dollars. So so Bitcoin are chips in the casino. You can gamble, have fun, kind of entertainment, make money, lose money. Most people lose money, actually. Yeah. Some people have made it a lot. It's true. No, you don't. Just keep the gold. I don't I don't convert gold to dollars. I like the I, you have the gold for the day when the dollar's not worth anything. That's why you have the gold. And everyone's gonna be saying, get me some gold. So that's number one. Number two, um tell me the use case for Bitcoin. I mean, there is no use case. As a as a form of speculation, as a form of gambling, yeah, it's the chip in the casino. I'll grant that. I understand by the people people tell me, oh Jim, you're technophobic, you don't understand. I, I read I read Nakamoto's paper in 2009 when it came out. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. I've been in big I've been in gold bitcoin debate since 2010. I never yes. lost by the way. Yes. So I get it. I get the technology, I get the math. Uh, but I also understand monetary economics and there is no use case for bitcoin except for entertainment. Thanks for joining today's insightful discussion with Jim Rickards. We explored historical financial crisis patterns, including the potential return of a banking crisis in 2024, drawing parallels to 1998 and 2007 to 2008. We delved into the world of cryptocurrencies, with Rickards comparing Bitcoin to a casino chip, emphasizing its speculative nature and highlighting the importance of tangible assets like gold amid economic uncertainties. In the latter part, Rickards outlined factors driving the rise in gold prices in 2024, constant supply, increasing demand from central banks, and the impact of declining interest rates. As rates are expected to drop steeply, Rickards anticipates a significant increase in gold prices. If you found this valuable, subscribe, like, and hit the bell for the latest financial insights. Share your thoughts in the comments.